Wait, let me get a clip. I also did an yeah. I also did an interview for an acting job this morning. I am very <laughs> happy for that. Central cast. And also back. I'm very I'm very Go happy that you that. found time to discuss with me all kinds of uh, social transformation, political transformation within the US from 1950s, 1960s, early 1960s until uh, 2023. Oh, and yeah, we yeah. can say that uh, the US society drastically changed internally from that period compared to 21st century. So what's your experience about that? There were a few changes. All right, there were uh, several changes. Uh, one of the, the biggest things was in the 60s, in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, I think that change was even more profound than what's going on now because um, in the 50s, you had uh, a society that was um, very uh, hierarchical, uh, very uh, somewhat rigid, pretty racist, and uh, and uh, roles were defined for women and men in very uh, narrow ways. Although my mother broke, you know, went and became educated, became a professor, so there were exceptions, but um, the uh, the fifties um, uh, were very uh, well, post war. Uh, post World War II was pretty economically um, successful, and uh, the fifties uh, also provided with the uh, GI Bill from World War II provided great opportunities for people to climb the social ladder coming yeah. back from World War II that they, uh, the men got free college education uh, for free, where now, if you want to get a college education, you're paying, you know, like for the cost of uh, what would sustain a, a couple of villages in Africa for a year, for yeah. one year of college. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Even, even, even so, though, listen, even though people come from different uh, war theaters these days, but nobody is giving them uh, free education or opportunities exactly right. to continue yeah. their education uh, for, let's say, fav favorable charges, maybe not for free, right. but for favorable char charges, which means that they, they became... And if, uh, you, can, if you were uh, part of the, the GI Bill, yeah. with the GI Bill, people went to medical school uh, who never would have gone to medical school. People yeah. who who were immigrants, you know, uh, a close friend of mine became a doctor uh, at Yale. He went to Yale Medical School for free. His parents were Greek immigrants. Um, people went to law school and got my mother a job teaching in college, uh, even though she was a woman uh, in a field of economics where there weren't a lot of females that weren't taken seriously because they needed teachers. The colleges expanded because suddenly they had all these students coming back with the GI Bill. On top of that, in the 50s, if you were in World War II with the GI Bill, you could get loans to uh, buy homes at very good um, rates, which is impossible now, unless you were Black. If you were Black, you could get the money to go to school. And I had friends of mine who went to Juilliard and studied in England, um, and, and Black friends of mine who were uh, after World War II, were soldiers and were able to get educated. But if you were black, you couldn't get a loan, a mortgage, to buy a house. So, uh, so they would still have huge elements of racism. So uh, the fifties had a lot of prosperity, and people uh, had hope um, that you could climb the social ladder and live the so-called American dream. Um, and while the country was still racist. Uh, the blacks could, uh, could progress economically because the economy was good. Uh, there were good interest rates. Um, and uh, the, you have the rise of the black middle class. Um, because I remember in uh, Jersey where I was living um, when I was in uh, high school and elementary and high school, that whole entire sections of uh, some small towns became black because uh, 
one or two black families would move in. The whites would panic and move out and you had predatory real estate uh, people who would um, give, sell, would buy homes cheap from panicked white people because they might have a black neighbor <laughs> and sell to blacks. And so you had white flight and then they would sell to blacks at very high prices. So they made a killing. But where I grew up on my block, we had a black family moving across the street and everybody was fine with it. So all whites weren't racist. We, we became very close friends with the Gordons. They owned a, the local liquor store in the town and they were a wonderful family. Um, their daughter became a doctor and they were just great. So not all white people were, were racist. Some of them were just fine. Now, uh, what, what I think is one of the major things for the civil rights movement. Do you remember the movie Hairspray? Oh yeah, of course. Okay. Well, uh, I think that black, that rock and roll music, which I listened to all the time and grew up, you know, as a teenager, oh, good. Um, and, you know, young kid listening to rock and roll music. And I still have my 45s uh, in a box. <laughs> yeah. um, you, that, you, uh, you, listen, you, you you're a hoarder. You, ho you hoard this stuff. It's your I do. You're a hoarder. Of course. No, of course. <laughs> I, I'm a historian. I'm a historian. I can't throw anything out. You shouldn't so, <laughs> so, but the, um, the, the white kids were all dancing to black music. I remember my father making some comment to like, why do you only listen to black music? You know, what's wrong with King Crosby <laughs> or Perry Como or whatever? And it was kids who danced. I really feel that had a huge impact on the civil rights movement because when the blacks started marching, the white kids who were dancing rock and roll all the time and for years were, were for the blacks. They were on their side because they already identified with them culturally through the music. And then you have the growth of jazz, which is a less, was a more esoteric group of people, um, of young people. But, you know, people, I mean, I started listening to jazz in college and used to go to jazz clubs in Baltimore, Maryland, which is kind of a Southern state. But um, but I want to tell you a story that's very important to understand uh, how, um, how uh, critical this period of the late 50s, early 60s was for civil rights. And it wasn't just the political stuff. Besides the music, you have incidents where, um, uh, of course, you have all the civil rights, have freedom fighters and people dying and all of that. But I wasn't really connected to that. I was in college, uh, at Catholic Women's College uh, in Maryland, conservative. And we had a black student in our class and I was in the history international relations club. She was in it too. And um, we traveled to uh, an embassy in Washington DC on a bus. And the head of our bus was this big nun, you know, this huge nun, the size of a tank, Sister Frances Therese. She's a history doctrine history, brilliant woman. So she marched us on this bus, there were about 40 of us. We went to visit some embassy in DC, I think it was Turkey. We visited the Turkish embassy, hosted us. And we came back, and if you know the geography of America, Washington is really in Virginia. Now, Virginia yeah. is south, and this is before the civil rights laws were passed. This is like in 19, it would have been like 19, uh, 60 maybe yeah. and um because the, the civil rights law until 64. so yeah um, we're talking civil rights started technically technically they started in 1954 but yeah, uh they they exactly they became uh more powerful social in 1964. so it took them 10 right. years at least more anyhow so we got off the bus we were hungry so Sister Frances Therese ordered the bus driver. There was a Howard Johnson's, which is a big food restaurant chain. Yeah. Uh, and we got off. All of us go march into the Howard Johnson's. And we all sit and we order, including this black student who was part of our group. So that we all order. They take our orders. And a waitress comes over and says to my black friend who was sitting close to me, uh, I'm sorry, you'll have to take your food. You can't eat it in the restaurant here. You'll have to take it uh, outside. Okay, 
So, you know, we're Yankees. We're from the North. Yeah. We, we're not yeah, used to this kind of shit. We're in Virginia. Um, I never saw anything like this. I, I was horrified. It was so embarrassing. And Sister Frances Therese was a New Yorker. <laughs> yeah. She got up in her big nun outfit, you know, weighing about 200 pounds and said, if she can't eat with us, none of us are going to eat and marched all of us out on the bus. And I poor, my poor friend Oliver was saying, no, it's okay. I don't mind. I'll eat. I'll eat. But that was the kind of um, tension that was going on around the 50s and 60s. And I feel for me to have experienced that made me uh, profoundly conscious of of how horrible, you know, the whole segregation system was and how unjust uh, and inhumane it was. And then I went to Peace Corps training. Um, I went to graduate school after that out in the Northwest um, where there were very few blacks, so there was no like big civil rights issue. And uh, then I signed up to go to Nigeria as part of my, my protest for the civil rights movement was to go to Nigeria and experience African culture and bring it yeah. back. America. So that's why my parents were horrified. They didn't want me to go. <laughs> I, I was going to die. But you know what the government did? It was the summer of the Civil Rights March. Okay. The big summer of the Civil Rights March. It's 1964, if I'm not mistaken. Right, right. Mar yeah. uh, 63, no, 1963. Martin okay. Luther King, that was his big I Have a Dream speech. Yeah. Right. Now, I wanted to go. But I went to uh, Peace Corps training at Columbia College in, in New York. And just yeah. before we left, it was the end of our training. And we were supposed to go back to our homes for a couple of weeks. And then we were being shipped to Nigeria. But what happened before we left, the government put up signs on the bulletin boards forbidding us to go to the Civil Rights March. The American government. Yeah for paid Peace Corps volunteers from going to the Civil Rights March. They said, if you went to the Civil Rights March, that would endanger your status as a Peace Corps uh, volunteer. Now, I've just gone through two months of, you know, three months of training. I'm all gun ho I want to go to Nigeria. Um, and then it turned out I didn't have time to go to the Civil Rights March because I had one parent on one coast and the other parent on the other coast. So I had to fly back and forth between the East and the West. And I, I really couldn't squeeze in. It was too expensive for me to be able to get down to DC. So I never went to the Civil Rights March, but I, I don't think anybody in our group got to the Civil Rights March. Although we wanted to go, we were um, you know, warned by the American government not to go. And that's how things were. That's You're talking about 1963 so the huge when he organized the uh, I Have a Dream uh, that was shit. March. That was 64. Yeah, it was 1963. Right. Even, even Kennedy, Kennedy was alive at that time. That's right. Yeah, Kennedy got shot right after I got to yeah. Nigeria. So, uh, do, do you think it's uh, correlated the assassination of Kennedy? Later on, assassination of Martin Luther King. Yeah, and... they're all coordinated. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, we have an element, you know, people think what's going on now is different. You know, uh -huh. everybody's freaking out about Trump, about yeah. white supremacy and stuff. Baby, they've been around since the get go. When I was yeah. at the University of Oregon, they had white militia towns that were uh, flight camps for white supremacists, white militias in Idaho in Eastern Oregon, Eastern Washington State. When I was in uh, graduate school taking history classes, uh, they had little old ladies and sneakers sitting in the back of classrooms, taking notes on what the professors said. Of course. So they could get the professors fired. So this has been an element in American culture. Or, 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 or to put pressure oh. pressure on professors or maybe blackmail them or, or, or right, threaten right, them right. To, to leave the place or maybe harm them physically. That's because, why McCarthy was so yeah. successful. He had a lot of people supporting him. Um, oh, you yeah. know, there's always been this white nationalist, fascist, bigoted, racist element in this country from the very beginning. Of Nothing course. new. Look at Andrew Jackson. You True. know, look at what we did to the Native Americans. So while I'm very upset about what's going on today, 
because I'm older and I have a historical perspective, I know this is nothing new. This is nothing new, but I feel we have a good chance to defeat it now because of the social media. They can't get away with as much. They can't do it in the dark. The, the light is shining on them because of social media. Last night, there's a huge case now against Giuliani, who yeah. I personally detest. I always hated him when he was mayor of New York. He was a fascist pig dictator. And they just caught all kinds of stuff on him. Last night, it was uh, the case just came public. It's disgusting, but they really have him. So there's been this element in American culture all along. So it's it, the changes, Stephen, are, Stephen, are not changes. It's really um, a flow uh, where, where, where um, things come out. And the whole hippie, the 60s were the big yeah. transformation from the 50s to the 60s. Because it was the 60s when people started saying, no, you know, we don't like this power structure. We don't like racism. Um, we don't want to go to war. All of this joined up. And it was the 60s. That was a huge cultural paradigm shift. Huge paradigm shift. I was, I went, went away to the Peace Corps. Yeah. And America was normal. I came back and... America was like a totally changed place in two years. You had the Beatles, you had the LSD, drugs, free sex, insane. And then, of course, you started the Vietnam War. And I got very involved in the Vietnam War uh, because I had it lost a lot of students in Africa during the Biafra conflict. And then I come home and I'm teaching and my students are going to Vietnam and getting killed. And I got sick of it. I said, I'm working too hard to educate these kids to have them all killed off. So I started uh, together with Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker and the Catholic Peace Fellowship, Jewish Peace Fellowship, Episcopal Peace Fellowship. I started a whole uh, center of the Lower East Side for draft counseling, helping guys get out of the army, helping people declare conscientious objection, getting them up to Canada through Underground Railroad um, and uh, marching in the streets all the time for every demonstration against the war. But it was the 60s that was the big shift um, in, in everything. And that along came with the birth control pill. So you have the sexual revolution. You have the um, the uh, political revolution, the anti-war revolution. You have the civil rights movement. Very powerful stuff. Very powerful stuff. All at once. <laughs> uh, listen, what do you think about uh, NRA? Because NRA was very powerful oh, back in 50s and 60s. Yeah. And they're still very powerful. They're supported by definitely yeah. the Republican Party. Yeah. And if you look yeah. at uh, at those huh, faces who support yeah. uh, NRA, they look like a bunch of criminals in in a suit. They are. I don't know. I, I don't know. Did you watch uh, recent photos? They support DeSantis. And they're going to support the uh, okay. Republicans in upcoming elections. They're horrible. Yeah. These are criminal. These, uh, you know what I I feel this is a. Um, these are men who have sexual problems. Maybe. And the gun. This is my theory, and a lot of other people agree with me, especially women, because the guys I know who are gun collectors, yeah, have issues. Okay. I mean, they have a gun. I think it all has to do with this. It, it all has to do. No, it's not having a gun is nothing. I mean, I've had I have guns just like uh, a revolver at my I house. I grew up with guns. Yeah. When I was my uncle, I spent summers on my uncle's farm. I learned to yeah. shoot at 22. I'm not against guns. My daughter's yeah. a very good marksman. By, by the way, you, where, where your uncle uh, used to live? In New York City or, or outside uh, of New York and yeah. New Jersey? Well, I had a lot of uncles. Um, but the one that had the farm was upstate New York. Yeah. So he was in New York. I had another, but I had another uncle who worked with Trump. Okay. He was a city, an engineer with us in the city of New York and my father. And my uncle Gil, Gilbert Taylor, who was the president who started the engineers union for the New York City. Yeah. Um, when I was a little kid, he told me about how what crooks Trump was. Of course he is. He always complained about them that they were crooks. That um, they had dealings with them, and he told me uh, 
that they were crooks. And I told some of my American friends, I'm not going to name names, yeah, you Jordan, don't who, were, who were pro-Trump. And I would tell of them, course. listen, don't vote for Trump. They're crooks. My father, my uncle all told me when I was a kid that they were crooks. Oh, no, they don't want to hear. You know, people who love Trump, it's like a, a, a cult. He's a cult figure. It has nothing to do with facts. Uh, it's only that they he represents um, something to them that they don't care what he's like. They don't care what he does. Who he, you know, he uh, he made that statement himself. I could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, and nobody would do anything to him. He could get away with it, and he's absolutely right. Uh, people, um, uh, it's a uh, it's a worship. It's an idolatry, a form of idolatry. At all. But, but like by the way, do you think that he is going to become uh, a Republican representative? I hope so. You think so? I, I hope so, because he'll lose. Everybody hates no, him. No, he's going to win. lose. No, no, no. I don't think that he's going to become uh, the next representative. I think he will. I think he will. No, I, I believe I DeSantis is going to be the representative of uh, the Republican like, Party. Well, DeSantis has no personality. He has no people okay. skills. A lot of skeletons in his closet. And what he's doing to Florida is horrifying. And you know who's going to defeat all these GOPs? are going to be the women because of what's going on with abortion rights and war, okay. uh, Roe versus Wade. Um, women are not going to put up with it. Uh, the suburban women may not go out and wave flags for the Democrats, but they're not going to vote for the Republicans. No way. So I hope they I hope they elect Trump because uh, he'll be defeated. Uh, he's so despised and um, um, he's become so extreme and he looks awful. Uh, he so I look I, very young. Yeah, of course, he's he looks in awful. 1976. But uh, he, had makeup who, on, he had that orange makeup on. Who's going to de defeat uh, Donald Trump if he wins uh, a Republican? Donald right? Duck. Donald <laughs> Duck could defeat Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're too optimistic. Because uh, in, in, in 2016... Oh, I don't know. I, I don't think... I think, uh, I think Biden... Uh, well, I feel sorry for Biden. I mean, I'm mad at Biden for a lot of things he does. I don't agree with him about Palestine. I don't agree with him about a lot of things. But he has done a lot of good stuff. Uh, the infrastructure bill, he waived student loan, federal student loan fees. He, he's uh, put health insurance and he's done a lot of really good stuff. I saw a list of everything he did, even just in the first week that he was there. He did pretty well. Oh, yeah. But, um, these old people don't like him, you know, and um, I, I feel I feel badly because I think he really has done a good job. Um, no, I'm 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 I'm, uh, I, I'm personally I'm, against both of them. I'm against both Donald Trump and and, and Joe Biden. You know, I, to be I, honest, I, uh, I, I don't know who's worse. Actually, Biden was more involved in politics than Trump, nomination. but uh, both of them. Uh, have all kinds of uh, controversial details in, in their biography. So I think the U.S. needs yeah. totally different uh, individuals. Also, the reason why Donald Trump won in 2016 was that Hillary Clinton was a horrible candidate and Democrats should have uh, yeah. had a different candidate, better candidate than her. What do you think about the U.S. society compared it's to another 60s problem. and 50s? Yeah, go ahead. Well, what's happened politically yeah. is they've gerrymandered the maps, the political maps. It's very dangerous. Yeah. See? So now the state legislatures are becoming all Republican because they're, they're fooling with the maps. And this is dangerous because the state legislatures are the ones that are uh, outlawing abortion that are the ones who are putting in very strict voting laws. You know, there's some states where it's against the law to drive somebody to give them a ride to vote. You, you can, it's illegal to give somebody a ride to a voting center. Southern states passed it is because buses used to go to churches 
because a lot of black people don't have cars. You know, they can't afford cars. So the buses would give them rides to the polling place. So the Republicans voted and get, made it illegal in some states to give somebody a ride to a polling place. So you have a lot of voters, black voters particularly, who can't get to polling places. A lot of states took away polling places. So sometimes you have to go 60 miles to get to vote and there's no public transportation. There's no way to get there. And when you get yeah. there, they wanna have like photo ID or picture ID. And a lot of old people, a lot of people don't have have that kind of ID. They, they're very specific. Yeah. Uh, even if it's a photo ID, it has to be a certain type, born and birth records and everything. A lot of these people, they don't have birth certificates. Um, so there's no way they can vote. So the Republicans have been very good going state to state, making it difficult for people to vote, number one. Number two, arranging the um, boundaries of the districts so that they're all majority Republicans. So those people will get voted in as electors for the electoral college. And this is the danger, this is how Trump or Republican win. Because like for example, um, uh, Clinton, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. She had more votes. We don't have a democracy in America. We have a, something called the Electoral College, oh, yeah. which each state has two votes for Electoral College. Of course. And they, the electors have to vote the, the way the state votes, but not the way the majority of the state votes anymore, the way uh, each district votes, which is uh, not plurality. It's not a democracy. No, so it's this not a democracy, public. actually. Actually, Hillary Clinton won um, elections in 2016 by more than 2.5 uh, million votes. So that's right. If, that's if, right. if, if, if we go won. by yeah. one man, one vote, she won elections in 2016. Yeah. Whether exactly. whether I like Hillary Clinton or I'm critical about her, whether I adore yeah. Donald Trump, of course, which is not the case with me, or not. So she actually she won elections in 2016, but yeah, because yeah. of the college right. system, uh, she lost. Yeah, and I'm I, fearful, I personally Stephen, don't think I, that Donald Trump uh, stands the chance in 2024. Uh, well, the thing is that uh, he doesn't stand a chance of the popular vote, but the same thing could happen with the electoral college because of all the machinations. And he asked me what's changed. Okay. What's changed, and particularly the last two or three years, has been distribution of the uh, the gerrymandering in the uh, drawing of the lines of each of the districts in, in each state. And uh -huh. they uh, each state that has a plurality, Democrat or Republican or whatever. And what they've done is they divided up areas that are Democratic and split them and put them in with majority Republicans. So uh, even cities like Detroit, areas that had Detroit, which would be all heavily Democratic, they're, they're <clears throat> manipulating these maps now so that um, the Republicans will be in the majority. And and this affects the, the votes of the state legislature. That's one thing I am, am a fearful of is, uh, what we we they talk about it all the time on MSNBC. So Donald and um, Chris Hayes they they always talking about the threat to democracy, um, and it's it's real and genuine. But the, one of the big things that's changed is the um, women coming forward about sexual abuse. Finally, you know, because women are always afraid to say anything; it's too embarrassing, and they figure nobody's going to believe them or whatever. So the, the case uh, E. Jane Carroll, Carroll won was pretty significant. And that resulted in this woman who wanted to, who had been sexually abused and harassed and mistreated by Giuliani, bringing her case yesterday into court. She said she was inspired by E. Jane Carroll. And now they have Giuliani on all kinds of charges, unbelievable stuff. 
They even got him that he and Trump had an agreement that Giuliani would get people who wanted to a pardon and they would pay $2 million and he would take $1 million and Trump would take the other million. This all just came out last night. So, so um, women, I think, are the biggest danger to the Republicans right now uh, because of the uh, exposure of the, the, a lot of the Republican biggies are um, really uh, James Jordan, for example, in Congress and uh, Matt Getz, he, he was ex taking underage girls for sex and the, I don't know what it is with conservative Republicans, but they're they they really do crazy sexual stuff, you know. Uh, not, not only Republicans. I think it's because you, they're you, in you, 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 you fix, listen, you're fixed on Republicans, but we 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 have cases of Democrats and people who are aff affiliated with the uh, uh, Democratic true. That's Party, true. That's true. who who are also involved with this type of but it seems the majority with underage uh, women. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. one of the yeah. one of the. Yeah. But the Let's thing say is, the so most I, prolific I, case was uh, the case of Epstein, no, who, who Epstein, miraculously right, right. died in uh, in in custody yeah. in maximum security prison, which yeah, is funny. Yeah, yeah, right, suicide, right. It's a joke. It's a joke. It sounds oh, like uh, a case in Russia still. or in Serbia when cameras are but, shut oh, down and nobody oh, has I, evidence yeah. that he was uh, yeah. killed in in a custody. Yeah, and that guy yeah. was pretty. Yeah. He was pretty involved in all kinds of uh, sexual affairs with the underage well, uh, prostitutes. Is a whole other, other. Yeah. But Epstein was was cross party lines. He he had something on everybody, you know, Democrat, Republican. He, of course, no, he, he didn't he make a difference between uh, between two parties. We have yeah. uh, Harvey Weinstein, a big mogul from Hollywood, who, who was also yeah yeah sent to prison yeah. because of. Uh, yeah. Sexual uh, assault or, or accusations that he was uh, sexually yeah. harassing. No, it, uh, it's pretty crazy. Uh, yeah. 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 No, he was disgusting, my uh, producer. I mean, his films are wonderful. It's very sad. I don't know what it is. I think. It's when they get to be famous yeah. um, and uh, they feel they can do whatever they want, which is what Trump said, actually. And then, of course. Um, you know, he's partially right that, you know, when they get to be famous, they figure they can do whatever they want. I don't know. I, I It's something I really don't like to think about. <laughs> of still, course. Um, no, we don't have the, to uh, talk yeah, about uh, uh, sexual predators and people who, who have all kinds of uh, mental problems. Yeah. But I think of their uh, the, the, women, the women now are, uh, but the thing is, though, Stefan, there is something about uh, a very conservative, repressive culture that produces this kind of behavior. I was just talking to a friend of mine, like, for example, the uh, Hasidic Orthodox Jews okay. have huge problems of sexual abuse and uh I used to see them out of the highway under my windows at five o'clock in the morning, and they'd be getting prostitutes, both male and female, uh, on the highway, the West Side Highway. Um, so that and there's a big problem in uh, in these uh, very repressive religious communities. Um, so I think that may have something to do with why um, you you tend to see, although it occurs with the Democrats, you tend to see. It more, in my opinion, with Republicans because they come from this fundamentalist Christian repressive background, yeah. Um, and uh, the, the, the Jews, the same, the Jew, and you know, most of the Orthodox Jews are for Trump, you know, the Hasidic Jews are all for Trump. Um, it's this the kind of repressive sexual society that produces it that is kind a repressive of society in every right. form and uh by any any mean it's not only yeah. sexually repressive yeah. we're talking yeah. about uh hardcore fundamentalists who are exactly yeah part of and... uh, a different uh sex of judaism and, and they they go for trump you know yeah. they're, they're for the republicans even even trump. during uh the COVID pandemic many of them ignored the uh, the warnings of uh 
yeah. of doctors yeah. and, and epidemiologists and they thought that it's a hoax. So yeah. unfortunately, members of that community suffered disproportionately from uh, the COVID pandemic, right. both yeah. in the US yeah. and in Israel. Yeah. And you have a lot of women who yeah. run away from these communities. We, we have, have New York a problem of women who run away from these communities. Uh, it's like the women who escape Saudi Arabia or something that of they course. run away from these communities the and style. they have huge problems it's in adjusting the same style. their lives. Are, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, same style. Yeah, it's the same yeah, style yeah, as uh, yeah. Muslim yeah. Fundament so, uh, fundamentalist communities or hardcore Christian sects that keep right. uh, exactly. members of yeah. uh, of that uh, sect completely isolated from the society. Right. They have a separate uh, education system. They're not supposed to continue their education in uh, in in normal high schools and uh, at the university. And, uh, and we have a of... problem in the city. Yeah. Go ahead. In the city of New York, there was just something on the news today about that. We have a problem with all the yeshivas oh, yeah. uh, in New York, that they don't teach uh, secular subjects True. like math, science, True. English, uh, you know, and the students uh, don't do well on the tests. And uh, the New York State did a report on it, but they're hiding the results. So they won't show the results of the report yeah. on the uh, poor education in these yeshivas and how they they're taking federal money and taking city money, but they're not teaching the students what they're supposed to learn. So there's a big fight now. It just came out today uh, that people want to see this report, and they, they the New York State Education Department is keeping it secret. They won't tell anybody what they found. I'm which going is to nuts. send you. We were discussing uh, COVID-19 pandemic and how some ultra-Orthodox uh, Hasidim communities and Judaism communities within the New York and within the Israel suffered because of their anti-vaccine stance. And at the same time, in the private conversation, he mentioned that many of them suffered uh, from PTSD throughout generations because of different... Uh, persecutions in Europe. We are talking about Europeans. These guys are 100% Europeans. They didn't come uh, from Yemen or, or from uh, Iraq, but uh, from the Pale Settlement. If, if, if you remember that uh, coin, yeah. Pale yeah. Settlement. Sometimes people yeah. ask yeah. what's the Pale Settlement. They think it's a Pale of uh, settlements around Gaza or, or some... Uh, settlements in, in the West Bank, but no, it's much older. Gaza. Yeah, it has nothing yeah, to do with Gaza. Yeah, yeah. It has to do yeah. with the religious segregation within the within the Russian yeah. Empire. In 1791, when Tsar and decided to... And yeah, it's, to it's European. It's European. Yeah. Uh, it's European uh, intolerance from one religion against another religion, because it was a religious division. It's not racial division or ethnic division. They look like, like uh, Orthodox or Roman Catholic uh, people from that area, but because of their creed, they were condemned to be in the Pale Settlement for 200 years. So how... how what, what occurs to me? Yeah, please go ahead. What, what occurs to me that yeah. um, the... Uh, Russian peasants were serfs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Of course. And when serfdom ended, uh, the serfs were considered barely human, you know, the yeah, traits of, of society. Yeah. And I believe that a lot of the uh, Russian um, persecution of the Jews had to do with the stratification of Russian society because uh, it was the, the persecution were pogroms that oh, yeah. were participated in by the poor people, uh, by the locals. You know, supporting the police and the military and stuff. Yeah. I mean, this this was uh, so. I often feel that uh, people on the bottom of the social ladder can often be uh, extremely vicious 
towards other groups uh, because they want to feel that they're superior because they've spent most of their history being treated as inferiors. It was it was tit for tat because throughout the history yeah. and during uh, the Polish Lithuanian Confederation, Ashkenazim uh, Judaism. I wouldn't call them Jews because they're not Jewish. Jews are in the yeah. Middle East, they're in, uh, in in Levant, in Iraq, and Yemen. But they, they adopted Judaism as a religion, and they were used by Polish nobility as uh, collectors of taxes, which was very yeah. unpopular yeah. job. Right. 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 And uh, yeah. unfortunately, they, they drew lots of negative feelings and negative emotions from... Uh, Serves and uh, petty, petty bourgeoisie in in Ukraine, Poland, and and Pale settlement and this area. So, for instance, in nineteen, in, in seventeenth century, in early seventeenth century, when uh, a big uh, rebellion uh, broke out against Polish uh, Lithuanian state by Bogdan Khmelnytsky, they turned their uh, animosity towards uh, Ashkenazim, or let's say European Jews, to be more politically correct, because many times people try to 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 correct my statements by by criticizing me for distinguishing Ashkenaz from uh, Middle Eastern Jews, Mizrahi and uh, Sephardim. But of oh, course, no. they don't know. They don't know historical background of, yeah. of these groups. They don't know how. They don't know what happened. Israel is like. Exactly. Israel yes. discriminates. Yes, it's very. Israel exactly. discriminates. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Israel is. Uh, if if they don't have a problem with Arabs within the Israel and Arabs in in the in the region, they would probably fight each other, because these groups are yeah. religiously and ethnically, ethnically heterogeneous. And probably right. they would have uh, conflicts a long time ago. Yeah. So right. this is what happened in 17th century. And in 2020, yeah. when uh, COVID-19 happened, many of these ultra-Orthodox uh, Ashkenaz, because in the U.S. Ashkenaz uh, make uh, 90% of so-called Jewry, or maybe 95%, you, you have a very small portion of Sephardim. Yeah. They they were exposed to COVID nineteen virus and because of their stubborn attitude, yeah, right. many of them perished. Over here in Jordan, the the most affected uh, group were some fundamentalists, but in general, the state managed to to contain the the spread of the virus and uh, yeah. they they managed to to put even the worst fund fundamentalists in the line. So they couldn't fool around and uh, spread uh, the COVID-19. Yeah. Unlike Serbia. In Serbia, for instance, we had uh, democracy, we had uh, so-called democracy, because it's not the, the, the real democracy. But we had this type of uh, option yeah. that if someone wants to spread a virus to 10,000 people, he can go to a party, or he can go to a soccer match, or a basketball match, no problem. Who cares yeah. if he kills five people or 50 people or 500 people? Also, nobody gives yeah. a damn. So, as you said, yeah. those groups were hit yeah. by uh, by COVID-19. By the way, how, how did you cope with the COVID-19? I, I, I never sat and talked with you about uh, the pandemic. Now, it's, a, it's, it's more than three years since the beginning of uh, of the pandemic, I'm very happy when I go out after my work at 11, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and I see a street full of cars, people shopping, people walking down the street. And I compare that to a period when uh, at 5 o'clock, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., we had a curfew with this ugly silence blaring and many times on, on my facebook i was making fun by uploading uh, the sound of the siren and uh, and uh, the video of siren. i never yeah. Yeah, i never really heard. Yeah, I, I was making fun but yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't enjoy being locked here for four days and four nights yeah 
Well, I was lucky. I'm the only one I know who hasn't had COVID. And my grandson hasn't had COVID. But my granddaughter had it twice, and that has affected her. She gets constant colds and coughs. Her immune system sucks. Uh, my daughter had it twice. Uh, her husband had it, I know, at least once. So my son had it once or twice. My His girlfriend, I'm the only one. She, they had it twice. I'm the only yeah. one I know. Uh, one of the few I know, uh, except for my other uh, two other friends of mine who are shut-ins who never go out. But I was very careful. I wore masks. I stayed away from crowds. Um, I washed my hands, you know, hand sanitizer. And I just would size up the situation. Um, we had these outdoor cafes that were packed. I would cross the street. I avoided crowds. I didn't ride subways or buses. I was very careful for two years and it was isolating. I didn't go out to a lot of stuff. I did church on Zoom. I did everything on Zoom. Um, but now, you know, New York is let up. You don't need a mask all the time, but I still wear it because if I'm on a subway or a bus, I wear my mask because um, my girlfriend across the street just got COVID last month. Uh, I've had two friends of mine who just caught COVID in the last um, couple months. And fortunately, because they had the shots, they didn't get it very bad. But it's still around. And when I went for my interview today uh, to Central Casting to update, to renew my acting thing so I get jobs in Law and & Order and other wonderful, uh, profound uh, dramas. <laughs> I, um, I um, you went there today, I had to have a mask. And actually, they said you had to have an N95 mask. And when I left home this morning, uh, because I'm coming so early now for this early morning class, I'm gonna, I'm gonna daze. I left my uh, N95 mask home, and then I tried to buy one, and they didn't have one in the drugstore. They just had a regular mask, and they said we're not letting you in without a mask, uh, an uh, N95 uh, mask. Of I course. shit. Yeah. But I went into the lobby, and the doormen were very nice. I said, "Do you happen to have a mask?" And they had a mask in a box, which was a pretty good mask. And I got it. I got away with my audition. I went and I, you know, they took my picture, a new picture of me, and I, I was okay. But um, I'm still. Um, I mean, I, I'll go. To, I go to church, uh, but I, if there's like a, like when I went to my granddaughter's dance concert, I sat in the hall and everything. But then when they had the crowd of everybody crowding, waiting for the kids to come out, and all. You know, where, where people are on top of you that you don't know, then I put the mask on. So, so far, I've been, I've been lucky. But also, the interesting thing is every year of my life, since I've been four years old, I would catch pneumonia and bron uh, uh, bronchitis. Bronchitis, every winter. of course. No, I, I remember because... Like but we, not, we that, not the yeah. last three years. I didn't get nice. it the last yeah, three years. Yeah, this is interesting. Because uh -huh. I wore the mask. Uh -huh. Because I wore the mask for COVID. Yeah, of course. I didn't get bronchitis. I didn't get the flu, nothing. Of course. So I've been very healthy, actually. I I know from since 2012 that you, from time to time, have... Uh, yeah, remember I used to get res sick. And... Respiratory problems. Yeah, I get the I respiratory respir problems. Respiratory problems with... Uh... From the time I was four years old when I came back yeah. from Puerto Rico to New York and it was cold and I was separated from my parents uh because of the war and i came home and i came to new york it was winter and i came from the tropics and i caught pneumonia you, you, you're talking on, about 1950s no not my i came back no no i was young i was a oh, maybe 1960s baby. oh okay baby. yeah i was a baby of course so um i was very lucky to um you know that the covid mask actually protected me in many ways. You know, the Japanese and the Asians wear masks all the time in the winter and stuff. Uh, before COVID, they would wear masks because they didn't want to get flus and bronchitis. And the mask actually does protect you from picking up a lot of, of germs. And in New York, oh, right. you know, you're surrounded by people from all over the world, every kind of ethnic group, every economic group, and they're full of all kinds of germs. <laughs> By so, the way, are you, are you planning to come back to Amman this year? I am, but I have a big problem with roommates. Oh. I still have that psych psycho Lebanese roommate that drove uh, Amman, uh, Ahmed Alzuni out. Um, and I have another crazy Italian, but he's supposed to leave it in a month. 
I have a sign in my back, crazy roommate supply here. Um, they make Kelvin look like the perfect roommate, I'm telling you. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, so I, I have, like a, like a decent I have guy a court case. The building, the, the building is supposed to evict me July 11th, so I'm paying a lawyer a lot of money. Yeah, to, you told uh, me that uh, uh, they're trying yeah. to evict you from, uh, yeah, from so the, the ca My case is July 11th. So I can't make any decision until my my case is solved. So I am planning to come, but it probably won't be till the end of the summer um, or fall. I don't know. I'm I'm waiting to see what happens. Plus, I have this job. Of course, but they'll give me a couple months off. I mean, the the job. You're is talking good. about your job in New York. Yeah, where I am right now, sitting in the classroom here. By um, the way, I, that, I have a uh, question for you. Yeah. Are you planning to go to Israel and uh, join peace activists? And, 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 and what's yeah, your well, experience in general? We, we can talk also about your experience as a peace, peace activist in the West Bank and uh, how you yeah, interacted yeah, with I... uh, Arab and Israeli peace activists. Because in, in many countries, people think that All Israelis are carrying the machine gun on their on their shoulder, and uh, they don't have any consideration yeah. about the uh, Palestinian Arabs. But this is not the case, and many of them are a proper peace activists, and they're very, they're very, very involved. A lot of them, yeah, many right of them now, are very a lot of them are very, a lot of them are very depressed now with the government, with the Israeli government, and you know they the Israeli peace groups have been shut down. Uh, they are being put in jail. Um, the uh, breaking the silence, you know, the ex-IDF soldiers having yeah. a really hard time. Uh, they're getting death threats. Uh, it's a they're, they're, it's a bad time for Israeli peace activists. They're there. Uh, the, there was hopes that the the Palestinian cause could be linked to the protest uh, against Netanyahu's court changes, where they have all the big demonstrations. And a couple times there were people participating, but the Palestinians are not that enthusiastic to support because what what what's interesting is that the Israelis don't want the court changes so that the military courts will have more power. They don't yeah. want to be treated like the Palestinians are being treated. Of course. But what would happen would make the Israelis be treated more like the Palestinians. But if the Israelis don't connect the dots and realize that what they're protesting is what the Palestinians are going through now, then the Palestinians are not going to get excited about it. Um, so I, I think the problem is, is that the the uh, protests in Israel haven't connected the dots to what's going on in Palestine. I think it's possible. Listen, to be, to be honest happens. with you, to be honest with you, I even think that we have to review some of terms because uh, if someone comes from uh, Yemen, or from the Pale Settlement and spends four or five generations in Palestine, he's also Palestinian. He's not yeah, anymore yeah. a citizen of the Russian Empire or Poland or Germany. He's a Palestinian. Yeah. So the term Palestinian is not accurate. We can talk about Palestinian Arabs. We can talk about uh, Palestinian Ashkenaz. We can talk about uh, Palestinian um, Yemenis. Regardless of the, yeah, a lot of the Israelis and the Zionists say there's yeah. no such thing as Palestine. Yeah, they I deny know. that there's such a thing as Palestine. They deny this, of course. Palestine. Of course, the, yeah, so. their, their, their argument is that uh, Palestine didn't exist in the history, which is true. It yeah. was part of the Great Assyria. That's true. No, no, but you have ancient Roman maps. You I have this in my film map, I made. But, but historical that Palestine, Palestine. Yeah, go ahead. That's state Palestine. Yeah, on they it. do. They do say. But the, the territory of Roman Palestine didn't uh, cover the whole historical Palestine, which is uh, part of the negotiations these days. But on the other hand, people who claim that uh, yeah, Palestine right. doesn't exist are mostly non Jews, European settlers who happened to be from Eastern and Central Europe and who adopted Judaism in, yeah, uh, yeah, in the yeah. Middle Ages. So they're not yeah. Semitic. And if we if we dig deep into the history, 
they don't have any any rational claim to come here and kick out uh, Arabs because they had problems uh, with Europeans. They should sort out their problems in Poland. Before 1948. Exactly. The Arabs and the Jews got along. Of course, they got along very well. You you have these uh, festivals of Moses where Arab Christians, Arab Muslims, I would yeah, say yeah, Arab yeah. Uh, Arab Judaists or or biblical Jews yeah, were yeah. were gathering and and celebrating a uh, festival of Moses because yeah. Yeah. Moses is uh, a figure for all monotheistic religions. It's a figure for all three confessions, right. roughly yeah. speaking, because we have uh, other denominations. So he's venerated and he was. Uh, Worshipped by Muslims, Judas, or Jews, and yeah, yeah. Uh, Christians, and there's nothing wrong with that. We have uh, records when uh, Muslims were worshiping with Christians, and Christians were worshiping with Muslims in Palestine, or let's say historical Palestine, or part of the Greater Syria, which I prefer. Because Greater Syria is more accurate uh, term for that territory. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have a Sykes-Picot division from 1916. Instead of uh, unifying the region, we fragmented the region. And uh, hopefully in the future, maybe some of these things will, would be sorted out. What do you think about uh, the prospect of this region? This is the last question. I'm not going to keep you longer. Well, I, uh, uh, I think I see some, uh, one of the uh, women, uh, Palestinian uh, or uh, Muslim women in Congress now, I think it's Rashid yeah. Jahan, I'm just Googling now. Um, she just introduced an amendment um, to uh, uh, recognize um, um, the, uh, the um, Nakba, and also yes, uh, to uh, support uh, BDS. So she just, um, uh, she accused, she just uh, introduced a new resolution. Now there's more support for Palestine in Congress than there's ever been before. Will be Bernie Sanders, a Jew. Yeah, um, of course. So that's he's not, he's not, uh, the the Jew, he's not a Jew from the Middle East. He, he also came from uh, Russia. Right. He, he's, and He's the guy from Europe. That yesterday, the UN yesterday declared it to be Nakba Day. So they had uh -huh. a big commemoration at the UN for the first time. And Israel uh, uh, and Abbas spoke, and he asked that uh, Israel be uh, you know, removed from I don't know, the Security Council. I don't uh -huh. know, whatever. Uh, he, he made comments uh, of course. against you know Israeli uh, voting. And the only uh, countries that didn't uh, go along with the UN uh, resolution was America, of course, so Australia, the United Kingdom, the usual Canada, you know, the usual suspects. But yeah, uh, of course. The, I, feel, I feel the mood changing in this country. The problem yeah. is, is that anti-Semitism is also so growing. Of course. And we have to fear find... is that anti-Semitism uh, will get put together with anti israel of uh, sentiments, and that's dangerous. And I've been saying this for a year that if American Jews don't stand up and speak out against Israel, they're going to get blamed for everything that Israel is doing. And there's a lot of, of, of all of my friends are Jews, and they're all against what Israel is doing, but they don't get that politically active. Uh, there are groups like Jewish Voice for Peace and stuff that are wonderful, but most Jews are still. Um, but there are a lot of Jews who are uh, actually speaking pro-Palestinian against Israel, um, but I don't know if it's enough. And I'm afraid that uh, anti-Semitism uh, is going to get mixed up with uh, anti-Zionism, which is really tragic. No, this is, is really wrong. Tragic. This is very wrong. Yeah. And uh, at the end, I'm going to tell you that uh, Sanders is uh, related to Larry David, a famous comedian. 
Maybe you didn't know that. Is he related to who? To who? Larry David. Larry David, the comedian. Larry, Lenny Bruce. Oh, Larry yeah, David. Oh, I love Larry David. Yeah, Larry, Larry David. David is related to my Bernie favorite. Sanders. I watched yeah, his course, stuff. I didn't course. know that. Actually, I can see they look a little alike. They I look love alike. Larry David. They, they, came, they came from Belarus or, or Ukraine. Seriously, I'm not joking. Really? Oh, it's <laughs> yeah. hysterical. Originally, they, they both came from the Pale Settlement at the same time. Did you ever see the Larry David episode about the Palestinian chicken? No, I haven't seen that. Maybe I should That's check the, out. The, oh, the Palestinian chicken restaurant. That is one of the most hilarious episodes. My son and I, we, I thought we were going to have a heart attack. We laughed so hard. What happens is a pal, uh, there's a kosher deli, okay? okay? Across the street from a kosher deli, a Palestinian restaurant opens up. A Palestinian that has very famous, great Palestinian chicken. So okay. the Jews are afraid to go in because all every, all their friends are in the deli shopping, but they want to try the Palestinian uh, chicken. So they sneak in. They wear put a disguise. Hi. Hi. Yeah, yeah it's my nice. phone. I'm doing it on Don't my worry. phone. My phone wasn't cooperating. No, no, um, no problem. We can we yeah, can talk yeah. about your trip to. to yeah, I, I um. We can start talking. Now you want to talk more about uh, not connections between Bernie Sanders and uh, Larry David. Who yeah. are somehow relatives, but uh, yes, your trips to Palestine, your trips to modern day Israel, and uh, your collaboration with uh, different peace activists in that that region. So yeah. please go ahead. All right. Well, I, every summer when I go to Jordan, I try to plan a trip to uh, Jerusalem and visit Ibrahim Al Hawa's House of Peace that always has a, a interesting people from all over the world. And, you know, he's friends with the chief rabbi of Jerusalem. Yeah. And uh, the Israeli government is trying to demolish his house. And he's been in court a gazillion times. He actually had a heart attack and almost died uh, last year when he was in court. Um, and they want $50,000 from him fine or whatever. But um, he's still alive and fighting, although he's getting old and sick. And the stress is killing him because he put an extension on his house, which you are not allowed to do without a permit, but it's impossible to get a permit, you know, for Palestinians. He lives in the Mount of Olives and he's a very famous peace activist. So I meet with him and then I meet many other of his friends who are Israelis or come from around the world who are peace activists. And um, then I uh, have been going up to Hebron where I made friends a few years ago with the uh, a very young man in his 20s who does an amazing job. He runs something called the Hebron uh, uh, Hope Center. And it's a, 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 um, a his family house, which is a large house in Hebron, dedicated to uh, helping the uh, psychological and economic needs of people, particularly women, under occupation in Hebron. And Hebron is one of the most vicious occupations. The settlers there are dangerous. They try to attack me. They attack uh, Palestinian children on the way to school. They actually have international volunteers that come from around the world to just take the children to school so they can get to school safely. The settlers are really crazy there. Um, and that's where they had that shooting up of the mosque 
by that American Jew, the Jewish doctor who uh, shot up, and killed 26 Palestinians. And my guide in um, Hebron, when I go there, this center offers wonderful tours. And he showed me, uh, he was in the mosque when it happened. And he showed me the bullet holes in the columns that protected him from getting killed. Um, so uh, uh, Hebron has a lot of, of history. And um, this young man runs like a hostel. And uh, so he has tours that come and he makes money from tours and gives tours. And the hostel is very cheap, very reasonable, uh, very clean, nice. They give them meals. And, and also the um, they get volunteers from around the world to give classes in English and classes in crafts skills so people can get jobs. They learn, um, you know, uh, very uh, practical things. He also has connections to a medical center and a sports center. But most importantly, they do therapy, uh, psychotherapy, because there's a huge psychological impact on the uh, people, the Palestinians living under occupation. It's a very high rate of mental uh, problems, mental disease. His own father, who was a prisoner, tortured in jail in Israeli jails for years doesn't come out of his room and his younger brother also was arrested tortured and jailed he also doesn't come out of his room so you have in his family he's got two members of his family who are deeply traumatized and have mental illness as a result of their experience so while I was there in Hebron I um I went there to do art projects with the children and I painted a mural with the kids uh, on the wall, uh, outside wall of the center. But I also traveled on their tour to Area C, which is the area that's uh, controlled by the Israeli army. You know, Palestine is divided into three areas, Area A, B, and C. A is run by the Palestinians. B is a mix. And Area C is all Israeli military. It's yeah. the largest. And it's the most scary and terrible. And I did a film there, which I... Uh, posted, I, I which I showed on my Zoom Palestine program. I have a program every Saturday at noon in New York called Zoom Palestine. I have it on Facebook Live, and I also have sent Zoom links out, and I discuss issues, and I showed this film. Uh, it was shocking to see the situation. And we actually visited a school that the Israelis were planning to demolish, and they had sent a letter out. It was the first day of the school. And they sent a letter out to the kids that they were forbidden to go to school. They confiscated the school buses and they uh, took the school teacher's car and detained the principal. But there was a, a trade union group from uh, Norway that was bringing gifts for the children in school. So they wanted to go to the school. So we all went to the school. I, I went with the Norwegians and um, the children, two children were able to walk to the school. The teacher got a ride. And the community had a ceremony and the Norwegians gave the children notebooks and pens and markers and things for school. Um, and the children were adorable and they cried and they said, they want us to be stupid. They want us to be stupid. They don't want us to go to school. It was the saddest thing I've ever seen. These kids were like eight, nine years old, just broke my heart. And, but the community leaders told them, don't worry if it's intense. Uh, or caves or whatever will give you schools. And the, a lot of the Bedouin, uh, the Palestinians, they live in caves because their homes have been demolished so much that they live in caves and the EU gives them solar panels that the Israelis keep confiscating and destroying. But it was a really uh, very uh, powerful experience. And I made a film out of it that I've showed here in New York and I've showed on my Zoom Palestine. So I hope to go back next year and um, I think they probably demolished the school now. I left my sunglasses there and they probably demolished my sunglasses along with the school. Mm. And uh, a very tragic situation. And um, it's so inhumane um, seeing children crying because they can't go to school. It's just heartbreaking. So I um, treasure my friendship with um, uh, um, uh, I am a Falkery is his name who runs the center. He's only like 26, 27. He just got married and has a kid now. He supports his mother, his grandmother, his father, his brother, his wife, and his kid. <laughs> 27. Yeah. What are you playing in, uh, in the coming period? In 2014, during the bombing of Gaza, 
You managed to come with peace activists from. Yes, uh, I went. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I went on a bus yeah. uh, run by, by the soldiers for breaking the silence. And we took a bus. We were going to go to Gaza because it was a ceasefire in the Gaza war. And our plan was to drive to Gaza for peace. And the bus was all decorated with peace signs. It's like being in the 60s again, um, you know, with flowers on the bus and peace and blah, blah, blah. And uh, we went to uh, Jerusalem and we visited, um, this was absolutely tragic, people who had been wounded in Gaza, a woman who had her leg amputated, had her three-year-old killed, the kid who was on the beach with the boys who were shot, and um, visiting the Palestinian uh, victims of the bombing. Then we went to um, Tel Aviv and visited the military hospital where we visited Israeli prisoner. Now, some of the... Uh, his family was not happy that uh, yeah. we were there, you know. But then we got in the bus and we drove to Gaza and we went to Cedar Road, where we met with uh, this wonderful uh, woman who runs a group uh, um, called uh, uh, I think, uh, Not In My Name or something like that. And yeah. she, uh, she has friends in Gaza. She said, we were all friends in Gaza. We used to go to shopping trips together. She would go to Gaza and shop there meet her friends, Palestinian friends, they would come to Israel shop in Cedar Oak. They were close friends. And when the bombing began, they were calling each other to find out if they were all okay, you know. And uh, 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 it was a very tragic, uh, her last name is Zion. Um, and uh, she's uh, hated by a lot of people because she's pro-peace and pro-Palestine. And she says that Netanyahu was using them as hostages, the people in Sidero who were getting the rockets and stuff. Uh, she said it, it disrupts their life. People have heart attacks. Children are peeing in their bed. Uh, it's a terribly stressful way for the Israelis um, to go through this. So uh, that was a very powerful experience. And we were about to go to Gaza, and then they started bombing again. The war started again. Israel started bombing again, and we had to get out of there for safety. So we got back in the bus. Uh, but the breaking the silent soldiers are truly amazing, totally amazing. And uh, I was the only American on the bus, but there were people from other countries, Germany, um, a few, uh, and I think England, <coughs> France, uh, a number of Israeli peace activists on the bus. So we got back, okay, we stopped along the highway, and we uh, uh, had a little ceremony around a tree praying for peace. But what was upsetting was when we stopped at a, um, you know, like a restaurant, gas gas station on the highway, there were a bunch of Israelis sitting in lawn chairs, watching the bombing and cheering, you know, drinking beer and partying and cheering. It was really, it was very upsetting to see that. Are you planning to, to visit the region and to visit the area in, in, in coming months? Yeah. Or? Well, I have to resolve my legal situation here, uh, but probably at the end of the summer or the beginning of the fall, um, you know, I, 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 I'll ask, uh, I, I think probably in August I'll be coming and maybe August and September. Uh, I have to see when the, uh, the, 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 the they have 12 week periods where, where I'm teaching now. So I have to see what the end of the semester is. And then I take a semester off and go, you know, I can go for like two months. Um, so, uh, that's my plan. And I, so I plan to come to Amman and then go back to Hebron. Uh, and the situation's gotten even worse there from what I'm uh, finding out. So, uh, uh, but the children were great and they loved doing the art and it was very healing. Um, and the women have it really rough because, uh, a lot of the kids have behavior problems, um, because they're living under fear. All the time of getting uh, attacked, and arrested. There, they have members of their family who have, you know, gone crazy, and, uh, and they, it's, so it's hard on children. It causes a lot of mental health issues for children as well. So I do these uh, projects. It's kind of art therapy with the kids, and it, it was great, you know. And and one of the worst boys who had was really he, he he a little kid, like around six years old. As soon as he saw anybody, he hit he hit you. He just constantly was hitting people, and um, um, you know he he really um, 
was uh, was affected by the stress of what was going on around him. and uh, I think his father was in prison or I don't remember the story but he in the art he loved he fell in love with the art and I gave him his own set of uh, of chalks and uh, to paint with and paint and he and to draw with and he got very involved in drawing and and all over everything he could find it, uh, it was wonderful and he calmed down. So I really see how valuable art therapy is, particularly for children. Uh, it really helps heal. It really helps heal. So I want to go back and do some more. If you want to add something, please go ahead. I think we, we spoke uh, for, for a while. I, I, yeah, I'm grateful, Stefan, that you're asking me these questions because I think most people don't care what I do. <laughs> and they think I'm crazy. Um, and uh, my Jewish family forbid me from talking about it. I'm not allowed to talk about it. No, you're going um, to talk about your Ashkenaz family maybe yeah, next time. Family, they they don't they refuse to let me say anything. And um, oh, here you can say whatever you want. It's wonderful. They don't, they so don't, I, they don't have any any kind of uh, uh, power or censorship to control yeah, our conversation. Right. Yeah, it's wonderful to be able to talk because even in New York, I'm afraid of to say too much. I, I had somebody attacking my door. He slashed by Rachel Corey, poster with a knife. Um, he's done really mean things. He opened the door, let my dog out, and then I got into a. No, this is a big problem, of course. I have a problem. You know, I'm living. Uh, um, you know, it's it's uh, being a voice of of truth, of, of compassion, of justice, surrounded by people who don't want to hear it. Yeah, <laughs> they, of course. They don't want to, they're not bad. They don't want to do it, but they don't want to maybe, know Maybe they're it. misinformed. Many of them are misinformed. And as I said uh, an hour ago, they also suffer from all kinds of historical trauma, all kinds yeah. of uh, yeah. Yeah. A complex of victim. Actually, they were victims in some uh, historical period. So for them, it's a tit for tat. And it's a payback time. Discussion with people, uh, a rational discussion, because they operate out of fear. They operate out of fear. Yeah. So you, you can't talk. So anyhow, thank you, Stefan. It was so nice. First of all, it's nice to see you. Of and course. nice to talk to everybody in Ahmad. I miss you. And and I'm hoping that to, as soon as I sort out my life here, uh, with this. Oh, we'll definitely see each other in 2023, in the summer of 2023. Yeah. I, right. I listen not, to I listen to discuss. You you're not some getting issues rid of with uh, with Mona, Mona Nazal, and yeah. we are we are waiting you here. Okay, well I'm looking forward to, so give everybody a hug for me. All the best. And thanks so much, Stephen. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.